What's going on, YouTubers? <clears throat> this is Buddy coming at you. Another quick video. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, today, I'm making this video because I wanted to talk about pest in the reef aquarium. Now, uh, what inspired this uh, inspired me to make this video was the fact that I had red bugs in my 20-gallon long aquarium. And I treated them with the heartworm medication that I talked about in my red bugs video. So if you missed that and you have issues with red bugs, definitely check that out and uh, get rid of those red bugs. Um... Like I said in my other video, though, I will be, I'll re I'm going to repeat that treatment in two weeks. So, I'm going to name off the, the pests that I'm going to talk about here in this video. I'm not going through all the pests. I'm just naming some ones that I felt were more common, um, that I felt like, you know, were going to be more common in a reef aquarium. Eptasia is the first one. Um, red bugs is going to be the second one. Coral eating nudibranes. Uh, Magano anemones. I'm going to talk about rust brown flatworms. Uh, Astrian starfish, which are very common, bristle worms, which are again are very common, and acropora eating flatworms are going to be the ones that I'm going to discuss here. I wrote some uh, facts down about them, so I'm going to read the facts that I wrote to you guys, and uh, just try to you know, you know, further educate you a little bit, or you know, give you just just, just some general information about them, and uh, really try to inspire you to to if you're not dipping, definitely start dipping and uh, hopefully inspire you to start quarantining. I used to quarantine my corals and now I'm going to start doing it again. Um, we all should be quarantining our fish for 30 days to um, prevent the introduction of parasites or diseases into our aquarium, aquariums and we also should be doing corals as well. It's not as it's not as well um, how should I say it's not it's not done as much as fish and it's not talked about as much as fish but um, it's something we should definitely consider. First one I'm going to talk about is Eptasia. Um, Eptasia multiplies quickly and can dominate a reef aquarium if not controlled. I'm reading this to you guys, this is what I wrote down. They pose a threat to livestock by sting stinging surrounding corals, uh, fish and corals. Um, when, when you're removing the Eptasia uh, it may release spores or eggs into the water column, further spreading the, inf uh, the infestation, for, you know, further spreading the uh, Eptasia. A variety of treatments are available, which uh, involve covering, covering or injecting the anemone with a paste-like formula that causes the Eptasia to explode, implode. Um, there is also tools called the Manjano Wan. I'm not sure, is that the laser? I'm not sure what that is, but when I was doing some research, I, I came across that. Uh, I'm not. I think that's the laser. I'm not quite sure though. Um, so if you guys have any knowledge on that, definitely definitely leave that in the comments below. So uh, we do do know. Maybe that's the name of the laser. I've used the laser, which is pretty cool. Uh, which forces Eptasia to expand from the inside out until they, uh, you know, basically explode. You know, just disappear basically. For serious infestations, a natural predator such as a peppermint shrimp, copper band butterfly, uh, fish. Uh, uh, can be you know can be used very effectively to rid your aquarium of Aptasia. What I've known with peppermint shrimps is they're kind of hit or miss. Some are like natural born Aptasia eaters, and I've had other ones that did nothing. You know, so they're kind of hit or miss. I would definitely ask your local fish store, hey, have you ever seen them eat Aptasia? Blah blah blah, and see what they say. Um, you know, some like I said, they're hit or miss. Um, I've bought them a couple, you know, quite a few times over the years to control Eptasia and to rid my aquarium of Eptasia, and they worked out very well for me. But from what I've heard, um, working at the fish store from other hobbyists, they said, uh, you know, this one, this one did it, this one didn't. You know, so from what I understand, hit or miss. Uh, we're going to talk about coral eating nuda branches here, which is another thing, another pest you may come across. Um, so I'm going to read what I wrote to you. Coral eating nuda branches are one of the most difficult critters to spot in your aquarium. And I'll tell you why they're very difficult. They're very small and often take on the color of the coral they're eating. That's, this is why they're very hard to spot. They're small and they can take on the color of the coral that they're feeding on. They reproduce quickly and can uh, decimate both SPS and soft corals, basically feed on either one, depending on the species. Treatment is tricky since the eggs tend to resist uh, coral dips. Uh, the dips are effective on adults, but the, it doesn't affect the eggs. However, you should still dip new corals as a precautionary measure. Physically removing coral, eating new to branches may be best, may be the best solution. Frequent dipping of infected coral, uh, corals, can help starve, starve out persistent populations. 
because you're killing off the adults which can't lay any more eggs and then when the the new eggs hatch you're dipping again so maybe every week you know dip the coral until they're gone you should quarantine them though take the coral out quarantine it or take out any corals that you feel should could be infected and be dipping those I would recommend at least weekly or every uh, every uh you know seven or uh, eight to nine days at least but I would do it weekly red bugs is another one I'm going to talk about here red bugs are small mite like crustaceans that feed on acropora corals in high numbers they can have serious negative effects uh, on the health of the infested coral while signs of these critters are not as obvious as flatworms sometimes they go unnoticed guys they are just as uh, pesky and even harder to remove. Dragon faced pipefish are known to prey on red bugs, but can be difficult to keep, keep successfully in an aquarium. That's one of the issues, you know, they're, they're great predators for red bugs, but they can be difficult to keep in a reef aquarium. Uh, currently, the only methods of control are removal and dipping the coral. Using pre uh, preventative measures like dipping and quarantining new corals is recommended and the heartworm medication that I've talked about in my red bug video. Uh, the second one I want to talk about is bristle worms. Um, I don't want you to panic or, or be concerned. I think bristle worms are great uh, to try to avoid and, and great as part of your cleanup crew, but I want to give you a little further information. Bristle worms do not pose a direct threat until the population is out of control or they live long enough to grow larger than four to five inches. You know, smaller worms can actually be helpful by consuming detritus. Large specimens, specimens are known to attack fish and corals and invertebrates. I don't want you guys to panic though. Most effective way to rid your aquarium of bristle worms is to physically remove them. That can be kind of tough, but you know, it is a great way to remove them. Uh, there are specially de designed bristle worm traps you can set. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of them, but I've heard many people having success with them. Although you may get luckier and be able to, you know, grab them using a pair of tongs or tongs or, you know, something with tweezers or something. Uh, I'd rather go with the natural, you know, species to get rid of them, like arrow crabs and various species of raspers. Rasp. Sorry, a little lisp there. Uh, dotty backs and hawkfish all have been known to uh, prey on bristle worms so that's something you know I, I like to go the more natural approach than setting traps and trying to pick them out of the rock work with, with tweezers and, and tongs but you know each his own another one I want to talk about is acropora eating flatworms acropora eating flatworms uh, they prey on the flesh of acropora corals and they you know they uh, you know decimate your SBS corals basically they eat your SBS corals if left uncontrolled Treating your tank with a chemical flatworm control solution, then removing and dipping your acropores are the best way to eliminate this pest. You know, uh, it, it's a lot of work though, guys. You know, it, it, but you got to do it. You have to do it though. I'm not, you know, it's tough though. Uh, acropore eating flatworms are best controlled with chemical treatment, physical removal, and or natural predators. I like to go the natural predator way, guys. Coral dipping. Uh, inspection and quarantining are key to avoiding the, inf the infection of flatworms into your tank. Or, I'm sorry, the introduction um, the introduction of flatworms. I said, you know, not infection. Uh, the introduction of flatworms from the start, guys. So definitely, you know, like I said, dipping, inspecting, and quarantining are the key ways to avoiding the introduction of these uh, acropora eating flatworms. Or any pest, for that matter, into your aquarium. So the second one I want to talk about is Asterina starfish, guys. Asterina starfish, we all have in our aquarium. And for the most part, they're nothing to concern yourself with. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote to you here, but there are some species that can pre present a problem. Um, so Asterina starfish are the most common reef aquarium pest. You're going to see them. I, I think every reef aquarium has Asterina starfish, unless you have a harlequin shrimp, which I'll get to in a minute. They usually hitchhike on live rock into newly established tanks. A number of species have been discovered in a reef aquarium, in reef aquariums, and they reproduce quickly by via fragmentation, basically by ripping off one of their arms and throwing it and grows another one. Most species feed on detritus and do not pose a threat, although others have been reported to feed on colony polyps. You know, they, they'll, they'll feed on corals, basically. Um, and other soft corals. The easiest way to rid uh, your aquarium of Asterina starfish is physical removal. 
the it's because of the size, you know, they, they range from a quarter inch to one inch in size. So, you know, they are fairly easy to grab with tweezers and tongs. Harlequin shrimp are, in harlequin shrimp, you know, they're, they are a beautiful and effective natural predator. However, if you're going to go with uh, harlequin, you know, harlequin shrimp to eat the astrian starfish, you have to understand that the that astrian starfish are their, the harlequin's, Harlequin shrimp's sole source of food. You know, they, they only eat astrian starfish. So make sure you have a healthy population of astrian starfish before you introduce a uh, harlequin shrimp into your aquarium so you can sustain this harlequin shrimp for a, uh, a, you know, an extended period of time or keep it healthy long term, so to speak, unless you're buying it temporarily to get your astrian starfish under control and then going to trade it back in at the fish store would probably be another option. Another one I want to talk about is rust brown flatworms. You may not even know you have these, and I'll explain to you why here in a minute. Uh, rust, brown, rust brown flatworms are also known as planaria. Uh, they are the most common species of flatworm seen in the aquarium hobby. They can quickly take over your aquarium if not controlled. And this is why you may have them and don't even know it. They tend to become a problem in aquariums with he uh, elevated levels of waste. So if you don't have a lot of waste in your aquarium, you may not even know you have them. They can become a pop. Uh, they can become very populated uh, very quickly, and they can um, basically they branch on on corals, you know, SBS corals and other corals, blocking the light from the corals, and so inhibiting photosynthesis, which will kill out the coral. Chemical treatment. This is how bad they can get if if. If the food is there, if the waste is there and allows them to get out of control. So you could have them in your aquarium and not know it if you're good about maintenance and keeping your aquarium clean. They may, the numbers may not get that out of control. So the way you would uh, remove them is chemical treatment with a product like Selfert Flatworm Exit coupled with physical removal, okay, is one of the best ways to remove flatworms. Natural predators, again, I like to go the natural way like raspes or drag rasses or dragonettes and other um, and other option another option uh, is dipping and quarantining new corals before placing them into your display uh, is a great preventative approach that will help avoid introdu uh, introducing these pests into your tank in the first place so like I said I like to go the natural way so rasses and dragonettes are another option to getting rid of them basically the natural way uh, and I like to always go the natural way when I can. Another one I want to talk about is Manjano anemones, which a lot of people may mistake them for Aptasia. They look slightly different. Um, you really should um, definitely research and look at the pictures so you, so you can see the difference between the two. Manjano anemones, like Aptasia, spread quickly and can sting, you know, and sting and kill surrounding corals, guys. So they're definitely... Manjano anemones and Aptasia are something you do not want in your tank. I don't even care if you have one... Get some treatment, get rid of them. Many of the in, uh, injections or chemical solutions for eliminating Aptasia are also just as effective on Magano anemones, which tend to be less, Magano anemones tend to be less resistant and die off quicker when properly treated with these medications. The Magano WAN is also an effective means for ridding your tank of Magano anemones. Magano anemones. Um, if somebody can enlighten me on a Magano WAN, whatever the heck that is, I, when I was doing some research and, and, and you know, dot, jotting down, you know, writing down some of these facts, I came across this, uh, where they talk about this quite a bit, this particular tool, I'm assuming, um, and I'm not sure what the heck it is. Uh, I'm going to do some further research, and if I uh, figure out what it is, I'll definitely put it in the comments below. I'm assuming it's probably a laser, maybe a, the name of one of the lasers. Um, and that's one of the things that you can use. The lasers are expensive, so that's why I didn't really bring it up. But um, you can use the lasers, uh, and they are very effective, and they work really well. I've used them myself, and they're pretty cool. Basically, it's a high-powered laser that cooks them. And it's pretty cool, guys. So I wanted to basically, you know, give you a little information about some pests you may come across. The ones that I feel are more common. Um, there are other ones like, um, you know, red, um, uh, well, I drew a blank. I, fireworms. Yeah. The, the, there are other ones like fireworms and other pests um, 
that you may come across. These are just some ones that I felt like were more common. All right, guys, so, you know, I really want to inspire you definitely. If you're not dipping, start dipping, and possibly think about quarantining, guys. If, you know, if you have an extra tank, it's something you may want to consider. I'm, I'm definitely going to go back to doing it. I have a 10-gallon tank with my T5, a dual bulb T5 light fixture, and that will sustain any coral from SBS down to, you know, Zoas for uh, you know a month. We're, we're not looking to keep them long term in this aquarium. We're just looking to keep them there for a couple weeks so we can uh, you know keep an eye on them, make sure they're healthy, make sure there's no pest on them. Possibly dip them you know two or three times while they're in the quarantine tank. This is before we're going to put them in our main display tank, obviously. So we don't need a real high powered fancy light. You, you do want something fairly good. Like I said, my dual. My dual uh, bulb T5 fixture is more than enough for my quarantine tank and it definitely works really well for me as far as keeping the corals healthy, colored up nice, and looking good while I'm quarantining them. Alright guys, this is Buddy signing out. I hope I uh, taught you something. I hope I inspired you to start uh, making, taking better precautionary measures against these pests. Alright guys, this is Buddy signing out. Happy reefing.